Okay, gentlemen. So now we are going to discuss blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Now, cryptocurrencies, I'm sure that every, all of you have heard of it already. You know Bitcoin, maybe you know some other cryptocurrencies. And the blockchain is the technology behind, uh, behind the cryptocurrencies. So without blockchain, there would be no cryptocurrencies, none of it. Now, my first question for you, gentlemen. What have you heard about blockchain or Bitcoin? I would like you to open the chat right now and write as much as you as you know about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. You can let me know. You can write words if you know some words or if you know you can write it in a sentence. I'm okay. But I just want to see what you already know. Use your user chat window and uh, use it for telling me what you already know about blockchain. Nothing about blockchain. Bitcoin has been kind of expensive. Yeah, okay. Expensive is a very interesting concept here. We will discuss it soon. Uh, blockchain is a decentralized system for computing blocks for, okay, good, good job. This is, this is kind of true. So you use the word decentralized. That's definitely true. That means there is no boss. There is no company. There is no, uh, let's say phone number where you can call and ask about Bitcoin or ask about Ethereum. Uh, so all of this is running on a code, on a piece of computer code. And it's about blocks. Okay, blocks we will explain soon. That's all, gentlemen. Nothing else you can tell me? Come on, guys. I need more interaction with you. Pretty much that's all. Okay. <laughs> fine. So uh, let's go back to... Uh, I don't know. Okay. Okay, fine. Don't worry, gentlemen. That's why we are here. So um, let's go to the price of Bitcoin where I wanted to show you, okay? Right now, we are going to a web page called, I'll write it here, coingecko.com. This is the website where you can check the prices and different stats for all kinds of cryptocurrencies, all right? This is the place where I often go to if I want to see how much the Bitcoin is and how much Ethereum is and so on. So let me, over here, let me show you. Let me just show you how it looks. And... Uh, here you will find a long list of uh, of the cryptocurrencies and uh, we are going to talk about number one bitcoin and we are going to talk about number two ethereum and today you are also going to set up a wallet uh, you will you are going to use cryptocurrency today and uh, but we are not going to use uh, bitcoin because it's too expensive for us now but we can use nimic this is what we are going to use today if we look at the number, it is 295th uh, biggest cryptocurrency. All right. As you see, it's very cheap. And we are going to use it for uh, transaction today. I will show you how. All right. Now, if we look at Bitcoin, the current price of Bitcoin is $15,835. And it has changed uh, moving upwards in the last seven days. So 12.4% going up. The whole market cap, that means how much money is in Bitcoin right now, is $293 billion, more or less. 24-hour uh, volume, that means how much the people have transacted there and back, mostly like, you know, um, trading, trading. So uh, $24.5 billion, $24 billion in one day. So let me show you the whole graph, how the price was going. So in one year, it has jumped up by 81.5%. We can see all-time high was about $19.6,000. So it is not very far from where we are today. We are now at 15,600. All-time low is not really true because it started counting only from seven years ago. So this is where we start, 2013. Bitcoin was around $100. And then it jumped maybe 10 times here in uh, 2013. So as you see here, there was this huge mania at the end of 2017. And then it, it uh, dumped all the way here to 3,300. And it seems to be going up again. In my opinion, gentlemen, but that's in my humble opinion, Bitcoin is going to go much higher than this. And this little, this little hill over here, let's say, this, this graph, it will look like this in the future. It will look so small, in my opinion. 
Now, the question is, what is all the fuss about? Why are people so crazy about this, right? Uh, a lot of people don't really understand what's going on. So this is why we are here today. And uh, I believe that at the end of this lesson, you will understand why cryptos might be a groundbreaking revolution in technology for us. I hope that you will understand. So let's try. Hey, hi, hi. Now, guys, I want you to only interact with me using chat. Okay, nothing else, only chat. So then I will see your messages. If you have any questions, if you believe that I speak too fast, then write it in the chat and I will answer. Okay, so here, let's begin. Let me tell you something a little bit, a little bit about Bitcoin, a little bit of history first. So there is a guy called, or maybe a group of uh, programmers called Satoshi Nakamoto. He was an unknown developer or a group of developers. We have no idea who this guy is. It's a big mystery, uh, but he was the first one who really uh, came up with the idea of blockchain. Now, blockchain can be it can be shown here in in the picture. So this is Bitcoin, and as you see, there are different blocks that are connected to each other, and they can only go one direction. So you have block one, block two, block three, block four, all the way to a few million, let's say a few million blocks. So this is blockchain. And uh, he actually started uh, this whole uh, mania by creating a Bitcoin in uh, early 2009. Let me go to this page, Bitcoin white paper. And there I'm going to read uh, the reason why he created this. Okay, so here is the Bitcoin white paper. And uh, in this white paper, you will find not only the code and how everything works. Let me send this to your chat. If you want to really dive deep into Bitcoin, you will find it here. Now, it is called a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Can anybody explain in the chat what peer-to-peer -peer means? You can also write it as P2P. Now, anybody can explain what peer-to-peer -peer is? I'm waiting in the chat right now. I'm sure you know it from other areas, no? Never heard of it? Okay. So look, peer to peer. Peer is somebody who is uh, similar to you by age or by what they do. So if it's peer to peer, maybe you have heard about torrents and you can download movies from torrents or games, right? From torrents. And if it's a torrent, that means you download it from the peers. So somebody else on a different computer has uh, the game or the movie and they will send it to you directly it is not going through anybody else it is just uh, you know person to person and my our computers are connected uh, to each other and this this is how peer-to-peer -peer networks work it's very similar to the internet in general so right now we are also connected through the internet tcp ip protocol and it is also peer-to-peer -peer right now right we are using the third party though right we are using the third party called zoom and that's a that's a centralized entity that will um, facilitate this whole call for us. So if it was simply peer-to-peer, -peer, we would call each other separately outside Zoom somehow, right? We would have to figure it out. Now, if it's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, that means this will work independently of banks. Because today, if I want to send some money to someone, I need to go through centralized institutions such as banks. Now, Let's read uh, the, the abstract, just the very beginning. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another uh, without going through a financial institution. So there will be no need for banks. If I want to send you money, I don't need to go to a bank and ask, oh, banker, please allow me to use your, your account and allow me to bring you money and so that you can take money from me when, you, when I send money somewhere. All right. And also, if you want to send money abroad outside the borders, it will take many days. And uh, also, they will charge you a lot of money for this. And maybe they will not allow you to send money around. So the thing is here, it was kind of a protest. Bitcoin is a kind of protest against uh, how the financial system works. It's a kind of protest, a peaceful protest, let's say. Digital signatures provide part of the solution. So when you send some money you need to know who sent it and who sent who sent money and where so this is uh, you we are going to use digital signatures today i will show you how it works 
But the main benefit are lost if a trusted party is still required to prevent double spending. So the thing is, the banks exist so that they will ensure that people are true. That means if I send you money using bank, the bank will ensure that I really lost the money by giving you the money and you received the money. Because if there is no third party, if there is no bank or if there is no one to control it, then what is stopping me from using the money twice? I can spend it twice or I can actually uh, delete my money or create extra zeros. I can create more money for myself and it will not really work. Okay, so this is why banks started in the first place. They were there to ensure uh, that the, the different people can trust each other that the transaction will really happen and that the transaction will go through and some, one will get less money on their account and the other person will get more money. So now we propose, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, the network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of a hash. All right, now guys, there's a lot of terminology we are going to get into. We will come back to this, okay? There is a lot of terminology already. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, so, as I said before, Bitcoin is a reaction to the entire way the financial system works against ordinary people. What do we mean exactly? So, gentlemen, do you know what happened in 2007 and 2008 in the US and then later on in the whole, in the whole world? What happened in 2008 and seven? Do you know? Crisis, yeah. What kind of crisis? <laughs> what kind of crisis, what do you think? Eco yes, okay, economical crisis. So the problem was that the banks were uh, giving money to people who could not really pay back and they wanted to uh, them to buy houses. A lot, a lot of people started buying houses like crazy and they gave uh, basically free money to people who could not really pay back. And then the whole uh, real estate market, the houses went down like crazy and everybody kind of like lost, um, lost faith in the financial system. You also see it today when uh, there's currently the Corona crisis and the banks are printing money like crazy. And uh, you can hold the money today and let's say you have 1000 check rounds you can buy something today, but because they are printing money like crazy and they are giving it to their friends in the government or giving it to some kind of big business players like, you know, Apple or uh, Amazon, then they are going to save the big uh, businesses. Small businesses will suffer. And while you holding the cash, you will be losing the value of the money because they are simply printing it out. And this is the inflation that we are talking about. So this was kind of a protest that now you have a chance to really protect yourself against the, let's say, the way the government and banks handle the financial system. So you can protect yourself, especially against the inflation. Now let's try this one. Bitcoin written mainly in C++, that's a programming language, I'm sure that you already know, is the first current cryptocurrency and it gave rise to the blockchain technology. So, gentlemen, we have to separate blockchain and then we, we can talk about different cryptocurrencies. Let's first discuss blockchain and what blockchain is. First, there are characteristics, things that are true for every blockchain. No matter which cryptocurrency you take, you will find these uh, features here, at least in vast majority of uh, blockchain. Now, the first, the first thing is that it is open and decentralized open source that means you can open uh, the code wherever you go uh, let me find it here there is the open source code of bitcoin uh, that you can find here it's on github so actually you can code bitcoin if you want uh, there were different people and different programmers over the years and they they worked on bitcoin separately Bitcoin is not really the same as it was uh, in 2009. It has been vastly improved. It, it was made more secure and faster. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was very active in the beginning. He was still programming on this until about 2011. 
and then uh, other programmers took over. And there's, again, there's really no one boss or one entity that could do it. So what you could do, you could simply copy the whole code or you, you can really uh, look at the issues here. And there are lots of issues. So you are free actually to solve the problems, some kind of bugs, you know, like little things. But those things really work well. Like, trust me that, you know, Bitcoin is working perfectly. Like there, there's not really any issues that would make you lose your money or something. So you don't have to worry about that. But there are still things to improve, such as speed or uh, security or better encryption, you know, a lot of things. So um, that's what we mean by open source. That means everybody is welcome to join and build on Bitcoin. Or you can actually create, you know, copy the code and create a different kind of cryptocurrency that will be perhaps even better if you want. Now, it is decentralized peer to peer. So there is, again, no boss, no entity. There is no company where you can go. There is no phone call you know, that you can make and ask someone about this. The second thing is that it's transparent. If it's transparent, you can always check the transactions. You can check the people uh, that are sending money there. It is still anonymous because I don't know the names behind the, the transactions or wallet. But you can always check the, the transactions. Like, for example, A went to B on this day and how much money was transacted. You could always see that. Uh, but uh, you, unless you don't know the name of the people who have that account, you have no idea who that was. So it can be anonymous to an extent. Now, um, although there are a few cryptos focused on privacy, for example, Monero. Monero uh, is, I believe, maybe the 12th cryptocurrency. If we go back here, Monero, Monero, there we go, uh, the 14th. All right, this cryptocurrency right here, currently worth $113. Uh, is focused on the privacy. That means when you send money through this uh, blockchain, nobody will ever be able to find it. Like who sent what and where, okay? So there are some kind of cryptocurrencies where they really uh, focus on making it encrypted so that nobody can see. But the vast majority of blockchain, uh, the whole nature of blockchain is that it is transparent so that you can really, uh, we are going to explore blockchain today. I will show you how, so that you can really see transactions and everything. It is permissionless. That means you don't need anybody's permission to use it. You can open it. You can use it. Nobody can stop you from from doing this. Nobody. No government. As long as you know you have the electricity, you can actually use it. Then then it's fine. It is uncensorable. So at the same time, if nobody can give you permission, nobody can actually deny you from using it. Nobody can censor it. There is no way to censor Bitcoin, no way to stop Bitcoin. There's simply no way. Uh, immutable. That means that uh, you cannot change the data on, a, on, a, on the blockchain. For example, I sent somebody some money. Uh, maybe a lot, let's say last year I sent some transaction. Nobody can come back to blockchain and change things in, in the blockchain. Nobody can really uh, change the data on the blockchain so that the money would be sent somewhere else or that they would double spend it or that the government would simply come and say, okay, I, I'm deleting your transaction. You are not able to do this. No, they can do it in banks, but there is no way to do it on blockchain. The reason for that, you will see soon. The reason for all of this, you will see very soon. Now, trustless, this means that you don't need any entity, you don't need any financial institution to trust other people. So that means, for example, if David decides to send me Bitcoin, uh, I don't have to know David because if uh, the big Bitcoin lands on my account, then I know it is Bitcoin. I can verify it. I don't need any bank. I don't need anybody to tell me, okay, David really sent you uh, one Bitcoin. There, I don't need anybody to tell me that because I can see it myself. I can verify it myself. I, again, how I can do that, I will show you soon. Real-time auditing. So that means when you audit someone, you want to check all their transactions. Today, if you want to go to a company and the government, let's say, wants to see the transactions of a company, they are the invoices, facturing, right? And then they send uh, invoices to different players and they will send the money back or no. 
it is very uh, it is it is done once a year maybe once a year and uh, a lot of money can get lost a lot of money can get stolen because the invoices must be in some kind of system where you will you will see them but this kind of system can be changed and this kind of system that we are using today is uh, changeable i can i can actually change the numbers i can change the invoices but if you if you actually uh, put it on a blockchain you can do real time auditing so you can check the uh, you, you can check the transactions of a business in the real time, all right? In the real time, and uh, anybody can do that. And uh, you will be able to uh, check whether people are true or not, whether they are lying or not. So this is also something that can be, blockchain can be used for. All right, so these are general characteristics for any blockchain. Now, let's see here. How does it work? Finally, we are going here. So this is how, the blockchain works okay you have or let me let me start like this blockchain is simply a distributed ledger where all transactions are registered and strangers can trust each other and verify everything so what we are talking about distributed ledger ledger uchetni kniha this is a kind of book where I can see all transactions. David sent the money to Easy Easy sent money to, to David on this day and this hum and this much, all right? And then it is distributed. So that means a lot of different computers around the world, billions of computers will have uh, a copy of this book where you can go back to the first transaction that was ever made using Bitcoin in 2009. And those transactions, how they went after each other. You can go back all the way to history and check the very first transaction. And at the same time, there will be new transactions added to the blockchain, okay? So blockchain is simply nothing else but the ledger, distributed ledger, a kind of a database of information. That, that's basically what it is. And it is shared by lots of computers around. This is why it is decentralized and peer-to-peer. -peer. Computers running nodes keep the whole copy of the blockchain from the first transaction to the last one, as I just said. Now, if you keep the copy of the blockchain on your computer, it will be currently around 42 gigabytes at the moment of uh, Bitcoin, of Bitcoin. So when you run the node, you are looking at the blockchain and you are putting a new blocks into the blockchain and you will tell everyone, okay, this is the new transaction. This is the new transaction, all right? Uh, others which aren't running a node, let's say for this will be us today, we can connect to the nearest one and send the transaction through it. So for example, I want to send money, but I am not running a node. That means I am not keeping track of uh, the, all the transactions that are happening on the blockchain. So I can simply use the internet and connect to, uh, to another, another node somewhere else. And I will use its blockchain to send a new transaction or to actually receive the transaction if I need, okay? So this is how it is decentralized. It is clearly seen here in the picture, all right? So not all the computers run the nodes, but you can run it yourself if you want. But if you are not mining, there's not really much reason to do it. Uh, I will explain what mining is soon. Now, blockchain technology relies on SHA-256 encryption. This is the kind of uh, encryption, it is cryptography, that's why cryptocurrencies. So this is how we can ensure that the information there uh, is encrypted. That means nobody can really um, tamper with it. Nobody can change the transaction, for example. I will show you how. When you have the encryption, you want to encrypt something. You will have the input, I will take A, and there will be the output, there will be hash. We will use the, this is called a hashing function. You will create a hash. And every, the same input will create the same output every time, every single time. So the same input creates the same output. And when you have the output, if I look at the output, I cannot go back to the input. So for example, if I only see the output of your uh, transaction or of your of movie, I can hash anything I want. So then I, I cannot go back to the input. So if I only see the output of this, 
I, I am not able to go back to the input. It is impossible to get the input from an output. Possibilities are two to uh, 256. It is about 4 billion of the root eight. To uh, or let, let me say it like this. It can be cracked only by brute force, by trying. So I will try input number one, and I will check the output. Input number two, I will check the output. And I will be trying as long as the output is different. There is no other way to find the different output. You simply have to take the computer and run one hash after another, hash, hash, hash. You will check one input, the second input, the third input, and so on, until you find the correct hash. So your chances that you will find it, if you, let's say, I will give you a random hash. I will just give you a random hash of a, of a number or of something. You have a chance one to four billion of, uh, of uh, root eight. This is such a huge number that I, I have no idea how to say it, actually. All right? Now, this is all nice, right? But this is just theory. Uh, let me show you soon how it works. One slight change in the input creates a totally different output. Let me see, let me show you here. We have the calculator. Let me show you how this hashing works. Okay, so we have the input here and you see the output right here, okay? So this is the SHA256 online hash function. So let's say hi. All right, or hello. This is the hash right here. Every time I write uh, hello, it will be the same hash every time. So hello, the same hash again. Hello, same hash, OK? Now, if I only see this, if somebody sees this, they are not able to really uh, go back to hello. There's no way. There's simply. You would need you know, some kind of quantum computer. But um, for this, if we got the quantum computer, we would be more worried about everything else but Bitcoin, because uh, all internet is running on similar encryption. So this is uh, just, you know, hello, all right? Then if I just change it a little bit, I will put a dot. You see that the hash changed a lot. And again, if I use the same, input i have the same output same input same output this is uh, what we call this hashing function right here if you want to know more how it works if you want to know more about this then i left this link right here you can check it after the lesson there's not much time for it now so uh basically you take the transaction you take the information in the blockchain you hash it you hash the information and you leave it on the block so as the name suggests a blockchain is a chain of blocks where each block contains hashed information, hashed inf transactions in the case of Bitcoin. So I, I, I will just hash the digital information of uh, how much money I'm sending to someone else. Each block checks and builds on the hash of the previous block. So let's say I have block uh, number one right here on the right. It has the hash. It has some kind of hash. If I try to change the information in the in the block, I will completely destroy the blockchain and um, nobody will accept this blockchain. No node will actually accept this blockchain if somebody tries to change it. The reason is that the following block that is connected to the previous block looks at the hash before. So this block right here, the second block, will have a new hash because it's a new information here. And also, it will look at the previous block and the hash of the previous block. If this uh, hash is changed, you change one little thing in this block, you will, you will, you will actually destroy the continuity of uh, the following blocks. And the other nodes will see that. And they will say, OK, somebody is trying to change it. This is not true. So that means this is why the information cannot be changed. Because in the blockchain, you would change the hash and the hash would not correspond to the following block. All right? So gentlemen, I, I know this is a lot of information. Everything OK? Any questions right now about this? So I have a quiz for you. I have a little quiz uh, right here. So my question is, can you explain this terminology? 
So blockchain, explain blockchain, explain a hash, and explain SHA-256. Explain this. These three, write down the answers to this. I'm, I'm waiting for you. Write, write down what's a blockchain, what's a hash, and what's a SHA-256. Right into the chat, yes, right now, and work on this right now. As I see, the time flies really fast, but I hope that you're having a good time. We can uh, extend it a little bit by half an hour, maybe, because there's a really a lot to talk about, I think. <clears throat> so I want to see at least one definition from you, like what's a blockchain, what's a hash, what's SHA-256? Blockchain stores, transaction, okay, known as the block. By the way, you can put anything you want on blockchain. You can uh, put uh, movies there, you can put any kind of information. But if for the cryptocurrency, we have transactions, that's true. Uh, the, or the public in several databases. Uh, there's only one database using it. only one database that is shared by everybody, all right? Is a chain of blocks. Every block contains transactions that are hashed. Okay, and also uh, Kirill, the following blocks are connected to each other. So that means if you change the hash in the in one in one block, then all the following blocks will not be true, and they will know it. Uh, is a continuity of each of uh, them work together in a way? They look back. Yes. Okay. Much better. Wonderful guys. And uh, SHA is the hashing function. This is the function we are using. You can study it later in your free time to see how it really works. It is uh, basically impossible to crack at the moment. There's no way to do it. All right. Anything else? Uh, it's a chain of information and an encryption that blockchain uses. Uh, every input has one output. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. And also the, in, the same input will create the same output. And there is no way that you will get the two same outputs. The two same outputs are very unlikely to happen. They cannot happen. Okay, let's continue, gentlemen. Let's go to mining. So now, blockchain itself is not really something revolutionary uh, because, you know, creating the block after each other where the information simply follows and connects to the previous block, um, it's not really something, you know, interesting. What you need to look at is uh, in uh, Bitcoin, we have the consensus algorithm. Consensus is that how do people agree? How do people agree around the world that, uh, okay, this transaction was sent from A to B and we all agree that this happened? This is consensus. That means all the nodes that are running the nodes, everybody will agree that, uh, okay, this transaction happened and the money really is uh, on this uh, new account. We are going to use proof of work. And this is the, the revolutionary thing about uh, Bitcoin right now. Proof of work, Dugas Prace, Doslova. Okay, let's see. I'm sure that all of you have seen uh, these kind of mining uh, operations. All right, so there are computers here, and uh, the miners spend a lot of money on electricity to mine Bitcoin. What does it really mean to mine Bitcoin? Let's have a look. Miners are looking for new blocks to mine and add transactions to the blockchain. So we have a blockchain maybe 200,000 blocks, and I want to add the new block to the blockchain. So I look at the, there's a, there's a thing called mempool, it should be here, yes. The, they choose unconfirmed transactions in the mempool. Their senders pay a small fee once the transaction is confirmed. Let's have a look. Uh, we have the mempool, this is the play. I want to send some money, some transaction in the, on the blockchain. And my transaction is not confirmed yet because it must be mined. So it, it will be in the mempool. It's a kind of a, an electronicals, electronic storage of uh, all the transactions that should be put into the blockchain. And the miner will look at the mempool and they will put the transactions into a new block. Okay? They will put them into a new hashed block. Th they cannot change it because then they will know that the hash was changed. All right? and they will put it into new block. But then 
they need to try to guess a random number. A random number is called a nonce. Uh, so if they want to uh, extend the, the blockchain, miners try to find the correct nonce of the block, a random hashed number whose difficulty depends on how many people are mining. The more miners there are, the more difficult it is to mine and the more secure the network is. So if there are a lot of miners, it will become very difficult to find the correct nonce. Nonce is just a random number and uh, you will have a limit, let's say from zero to several quadrillion, let's say, okay, a, lot, a very high number. And this number will be hashed and the, uh, the miners are simply going uh, one by one. They will try one and they will check the hash, two, check the hash, three, check the hash, four, check the hash. And they will go all the way up until they will find the correct nonce. The nonce is this random number that is very just random. And uh, it, it, it will become more difficult if there are more miners that are mining. If it's more difficult, then you need to spend more money on electricity because the computers need to run a lot of, uh, a lot of operations on their system. Okay, they go one hash after another. This is why we call it a hash rate. The more hashes there are, the more secure the network is. That means that the mining is very decentralized. It is in many computers around the world and not one person can control all the hash rate. If only one person controlled the hash rate, we would be a big problem. We would have a big problem, let's say. Okay, now, if some miners decide to leave, okay they will say okay i don't want this business anymore then the nonce will become more easier again and new miners can come in all right that's the idea so this kind of system corrects itself it will run even with uh, with a few miners but it will run even better if there are a billion miners right now you need a, lo a lot of computers to actually have uh, money for mining of bitcoin uh, today it is not really profitable to use, uh, you know, bit to, for mining Bitcoin just using your your own computer. This is not really useful anymore. This will not really mine anything, because the other miners will be faster than you in finding the correct nonce. So you will not uh, mine anything. That's the problem. Okay, the miner who finds the block will quickly tell all the nodes and they update their ledger. All right. So let's say, hey, I found this block. I'm the miner, I found this block. There is the new transaction and they will put it into the blockchain. There can be more miners though, who find the block at the same time. Because as I told you, there can be different nodes around the world and they are all running the same. They are kind of like racing. They are racing to find the correct block. So what can happen is that you have one miner that finds the block at the same moment as the other one. And they all both start telling the nodes, okay, here's the new transaction, the new block, put it into the blockchain. And uh, what happens? Every 10 minutes in the Bitcoin blockchain, the longest distributed blockchain wins and the nodes discard the shorter chain alternatives. So that means the miners usually choose very similar transaction. They will put them into the block they will put the block into the blockchain. But if that happens with another miner, which, which happens very often actually, then there will be one new blockchain that has maybe 10 blocks more than the other blockchain that has maybe 10 blocks less. So every 10 minutes, there is a, there is a limit of 10 minutes where the longest blockchain, the longest copy of the blockchain on the whole network of the nodes will win. And this is when your transactions will be 100% confirmed. And then the new 10 minute uh, interval starts and people go mining again for, for new blocks. And again, um, you cannot really go back into history and change anything because uh, you have only 10 minutes to, to mine all the previous blocks. If you wanted to change something in the blockchain, you would have to mine every single block again. And, uh, no amount of power in the world can do it in 10 minutes. Like 200 and let's say 1 million blocks, I think at the moment, 1 million blocks in 10 minutes, there's no way to mine this in the, in the world to, to how much hash power you would need and hash rate. Okay, 
the successful miner of the longest blockchain edition gets rewarded with newly minted Bitcoin right now. Uh, so there will be new Bitcoin created with the new block. New Bitcoin is created. This is why we call it uh, mining, because you are looking for a new Bitcoin. So the miner that was successful and who mined it, they will get in 10 minutes, they will, the, the network will reward, uh, will reward the miner with new Bitcoin. This Bitcoin is new. It's created uh, out of nowhere. Okay. In, at the moment, it is 6.25 Bitcoin per 10 minute blocks today, but it gets halved, halved uh, every 210,000 blocks. So once in four years, the last BTC will be mined in 2140. There can't ever be more than 21 million Bitcoin. So at the moment, there is about 18 million Bitcoin. There cannot be more than 21 million ever. It is hard coded in the code. So the miners get the money from the fee. Uh, where was it? Fee. Uh, here. They're senders. So if I want to send a transaction, I will pay a little fee to the miner. I will pay the little fee based on uh, how much information I'm sending. It is simply, but you are paying by bytes, basically. You are paying by how, how many bytes you're sending, not by how much money you're sending. That's not important. So you can send, you know, $1 billion and it will cost you $1. Or you can send $1 and it will cost you $1. It, it depends on how much information you are sending on the blockchain. Um, so they will get money from the fees. And also they will get money from the minted Bitcoin. Minted means newly created, okay? Now, this is what I wanted to show you here. This is the Bitcoin inflation. So we started here in 2009. This is on the left, you will see um, how many Bitcoin there is. So we started here, zero Bitcoin, and it went up very quickly, as you see here. We are now in 2020. So there's about 18 million Bitcoin right here. Right, like little over 18 million. Uh, this is where we are today. And as you see, there will be fewer and fewer Bitcoin going forward, but they will be more and more expensive, of course. You can divide Bitcoin into, into much smaller parts, up to 18 decimal points. So you can have 0 0.0000000001 Bitcoin if you need. You can always divide it easily. Now, and this is the inflation. Inflation is simply how much or how many more Bitcoin will be put into the system. So we started here, a lot of Bitcoin were created here. And then we met here in 2012. And then from then it is very deflationary. That means uh, more and more people want Bitcoin while fewer and fewer Bitcoin are created. Okay, that's the idea. That, that's what's driving the price up. If, you, if we go back to cash, I, I said in the very beginning, government prints a lot of money every day. So that's the, the inflation is this, okay? This is the inflation of cash. That means that your, your money will become less valuable over time, while Bitcoin will become less and less. And again, nobody can change how this works. This is already hard-coded in the code. Nobody, no government, nobody can come and just change this. All right. If you change this, then um, Bitcoin would still be Bitcoin and you would create a new cryptocurrency that nobody would care about. Nobody would buy it. Nobody would care because they would see that somebody changed the code. OK. Um, one last thing for, for mining. What makes miners play by the rules? Why should miners tell the truth and actually not change the transactions? Why they, for example, not double spend the transaction or change the transactions to send the money to themselves? Why not? Anybody can answer this in the chat? Why should miners be honest? Why should they really mine my, uh, my transaction? And why should they tell the truth? Anybody knows? You have the information, I told you already. If you think about it, I think you're, you have the information already. Anybody can try? Guys, then at least tell me that you don't know. Tell me that you don't know. If you don't know, it's okay. You don't know, okay. Now, why should they be honest? The reason is very simple. There is a, 
Okay, okay. Um, if you remember the hash, all right? I told you about the hash. So if the miner decides to lie and change my transaction to send money to himself or spend it twice, he will change the hash, all right? And if you change the hash, uh, it will create, uh, let's say, irregularity in the blockchain. And the other nodes will see that. They will see, oh, wow, somebody changed, somebody changed the, uh, the hash, somebody changed the information. So we are not going to accept this change. This is automatic. This is done automatically. We are not going to accept this uh, block because somebody changed, uh, somebody changed it, all right? And uh, let me, I have this paragraph here. Nodes would qu quickly see the changed hash and discard the block. All right, this is done automatically by the code. If that happened, the miners would be losing money by paying for electricity, all right? Because they first have to mine the block and they have to spend a lot of money on ele electricity first. So th what they want is to get the freshly minted Bitcoin and the fee, all right? And the only way they can do it is if they tell the truth. So because they can get the minted Bitcoin and fees only if they play by the rules. Therefore, they have a financial incentive to stay the truth. Okay? So if the miners tell the truth and they really use their transactions as they are, they don't change them and they will mine the, the block and they will put the correct transactions there with the correct hash, then they can get the minted Bitcoin. If not, if they try to lie, then the block will be rejected by everyone and they will lose money on paying for electricity. This is genius, guys. This is super genius because people have incentive. They will get money for telling the truth, all right? And again, if there is one miner who will try to lie, there will be another miner who will tell the truth. And the, the other miner will get the money. The lying one will not get the money. Genius, all right. So gentlemen, let's look at the blockchain explorer. Let's see the blockchain. Any questions, by the way? You can ask me questions now if you need. I'll go back to it. So let me show you here. So we are looking at the blockchain uh, of uh, Bitcoin right now. And there will be a lot of interesting information here. Some of it you already know. So this is the price. This is how many hashes there are. They, uh, they can only lie, uh, yes. But uh, Kirill, 51% of the, all the hash rate, you would need to have, you know, maybe 10 times uh, whole servers of, of uh, Google. You would have to have like 10, 10x of uh, Google servers. Nobody in the world can actually do it right now. All right? Like, like there's, no, there's no way at the moment. You can do it with smaller cryptocurrency. You could do it like with some small cryptocurrency. It would be easier. I think, but Bitcoin is already very secure and there, there is no chance of this happening. All right, so this is the hash rate. This is how many transactions there are in 24 hours. This is uh, how many uh, Bitcoin was transacted. And this is the transaction volume. Okay, now this is the mempool. If you remember, gentlemen, this is where the new transactions are waiting to be, uh, waiting to be confirmed, waiting to be mined by others. So if I send a transaction, then um, the transaction will not come, th will not go through until somebody mines it. So this is how many bytes there are in the mempool, and uh, there are transactions waiting to be sent to someone. So now miners are going to look at the mempool and they are going to mine everything. All right. Eventually, your transaction will get through. Eventually. These are the latest transactions right here. You can see the latest blocks at first. These are the latest blocks. So we are on block number six, six hundred thousand five hundred, sorry, six hundred and fifty six thousand five hundred and sixty four. This block had this many bytes and it was mined 20 minutes ago. Now, if you look here at this hash, this is the transaction hash, TX hash. Let's uh, look at the information because you see, this is transparent. I can look at this transaction. So what, what do I see here? At first, I see that this is unconfirmed. This transaction is in the mempool. 
uh, it is not yet confirmed by any miner or any node. So, summary. This is the hash. This is the transaction hash. If I changed one little thing in this transaction, this hash would be totally different. This is the address. This is who is sending. They are sending 0 0.16, 0 0.17 Bitcoin. This is the output. The output is the Bitcoin, all right? Uh, 0 0.17 Bitcoin uh, at the moment might be about $2,000, I believe, something like that. Um, and they are sending it to two addresses. They changed uh, the address. One address is here. They are sending 0 0.04 there. And then they are sending, uh, sorry, and then they are sending 0 0.12 to another address. And you can see it here. This is the fee. This is how much they are paying. So I believe this can be about uh, lo lower than $1. Lower than $1, this one. OK? It's still unconfirmed. You can see uh, the size of the block. You can see where it is. It, now it's in the mempool. Um, so value transacted is $2,700 at the moment. There have been transactions where somebody sent a billion dollars for one, $1. This can never happen with a bank because uh, it would take too long. Bank would take a lot of money from you. And uh, especially if you wanted to send it abroad, you would have a lot of problems with this. Bitcoin, you just do it. Nobody, uh, nobody asks any questions. You go, you go ahead and you do it. All right, there we go. So this is the Explorer. This is something you can do in your free time. You can check this. There's a lot of info. Let's go here. Let's talk about wallets very quickly. So wallets, Peneženka, right? They keep track of the user's UTXO, unspent transaction output. This is how much money you can actually spend. So this is the output in your, in your wallet. And then you can take this output and create it as the new input, hash it, and send it to someone else. Now, when you create a wallet, we are going to create a wallet soon. There is a mnemonic phrase, 12 to 24 random words to recover the wallet. If you uh, lose your wallet, if you, let's say, lose your computer or something, you can have this mnemonic phrase. And this is just a sequence of random numbers. And you will use it to recover the wallet, no matter where you are. Bitcoin is not physical. It is not on any computer or anywhere. It is simply a in an encrypted information. It is an encrypted information that where only one person can access it if you have the code. If you if I leave the code, the, the, the mnemonic phrase or the private key, the private key is another thing. If I leave it somewhere on the table, everybody will have access to my Bitcoin. Everybody. So if you keep your private key and mnemonic phrase safe, nobody can ever steal Bitcoin from you. Ever. Nobody can take it away from you. Nobody can, uh, you know, transact it somewhere else as long as, you, as they don't have the private key. So mnemonic phrase can generate more wallets with their own private key. So the wallet will have a private key and you can have the mnemonic phrase where you can create many different wallets. Now the private key is created from the mnemonic phrase by uh, mathematically, I, I forgot the, there's some kind of function for it. The private key is used for signing transactions to verify your identity. So you will use. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kirill. Go ahead. It's OK. Now, a uh, private key is used for signing the transactions. Then uh, anybody who has access to this key or mnemonic phrase can easily steal your money. So it's important to keep it safe. The private key has a form of a string of letters and numbers. Um, I will show you soon how it looks. So oh, if you remember the guys, we read the, we read the article. If the guy with the lost Bitcoin on the rubbish dump knew his phrase or private key, he wouldn't need the hard drive where it had been saved. Because Bitcoin is not really on any hard drive. It is simply encrypted and uh, locked information. So he has uh, 7,500 Bitcoin, which today would be $112 million. All he would need to actually uncover uh, the Bitcoin would be the private key, nothing else. He does not need to go to the rubbish dump, but he forgot, or I don't know, he lost his private key somewhere. Nobody has it. So the only way for him is to go back to his computer where the private key was stored. He has it on his computer. So he's not really looking for Bitcoin on his computer. 
he is looking for the private key on his computer that he left there and he forgot about it, all right? So he's not looking for Bitcoin on the rubbish dump. He's looking for the private key. That's important. Okay, now, public key is your address. This is what we saw in the Explorer when I said, okay, this is the address. Somebody sent from this address to another. Public key is the address and it's the hashed private key. So I take the private key, I hash it, and I send it to everyone, everyone to see. They cannot make the, you know, they cannot take the public key and look at the private key. There's no way. As we said, input will create output every time the same, but nobody can uh, find the input from the output. So this is what uh, it would look like right here. This is the public key right here. You can also use the QR code, which would make it much easier to transact. You would just uh, take a picture of this, right? And uh, then you can send the money. So all keys are generated randomly uh, with an extremely low probability. Yes. Do, uh, no, I have never been to such mining station, no. Uh, but there are many documentaries online. Now, all keys are generated randomly with an extremely low probability that one would get the same key. So when you, when you create a wallet today, gentlemen, your chances that you will have the same key as anybody else will be one to two uh, square, uh, sorry, one to two root of 256. In other words, it is a milliard in our small, okay? Jedna ku čtyře miliard in our small. This is your chance that uh, the, the key will be the same. That means if, that you will open the, the key and it will be somebody else's money, all right? This, this does not happen simply. <laughs> okay, wallets. There are, there are three kinds of wallets. The third party, Yosuba, the private key is held by someone else, simply stored online. Uh, common for centralized exchanges, if you want to go and trade Bitcoin, for a short time, you will have it on a wallet where somebody else has the private key. Then it is the web wallet or mo mobile wallet or banks in the future. I think banks will keep Bitcoin for others too. Uh, then we have paper wallet. You write down your private key. You write it on a piece of paper. This is why paper wallet and the mnemonic phrase, if you if you can, and you keep it offline. It will not be on any computer or anywhere else. And then we have the cold wallet. Let me show you, I have it here. Uh, it is here in the picture. It is right here in the picture. This is the cold wallet. It looks like this, all right? That means this kind of uh, hardware, it looks like USB. It keeps the private key on its own. And the private key is stored on a hard drive wallet which is physically used to sign the transaction. So for example, I connect this to the wallet online, and then I will look at the transaction here. There will be you know, some kind of information here about the transaction I want to send. And if somebody else wanted to do it, they can't because I need to press the button here. And then when I press it, then I sign the, tra the transaction. The transaction will be signed by me, okay? That's the only way, this is the safest way to store any cryptocurrency, the safest way. Uh, of course, no. There, there are always ways to steal money, right? There are always uh, smart ways to steal money from someone, but cold wallet is the simply the safest way at the moment. Okay, gentlemen, now, now is the time for you to set up a Bitcoin wallet. There are many websites which interact with the blockchain. For example, bitaddress.org. Guys, I want you to go to this address and follow what I'm doing, okay? Go to this address. Pane učiteli, my budeme mít další hodinu. When? What time? Myslím si, že v 10.10. Aha, okay. So let's just set up the wallet, yeah. Let's just set up the wallet. Yeah, too bad, yeah. It's a bit longer than I expected. Yeah, too bad. Sorry, guys. Now, here, when you get here, you will be able to generate the uh, the address. As you see here, you have to go around a little bit with the mouse, it is generating some hash over here. There we go. This is my new Bitcoin wallet right here. Now, because I'm sharing this with you, this is my private key. So this wallet is useless because you can see the private key and anybody will be able to see this. So this is what you need to keep secret. Nobody can see that. Don't take picture of this. 
you, you write it down using using your paper and uh, and a pen. And this is your private key. This is what you can share with me. This is what I would use if I wanted to send you the money. Okay. Now, gentlemen, send me your public key. Send it into the chat. Send your public key into the chat, yeah? your address. Don't send the private key, yeah. Mathieu, I think that you, you send the private key, not, not the public key. It's a bit longer, I think. Yeah, that easy was good. Good, yes. So, guys, this is your this is your uh, private key. Sorry, the public key. So, gentlemen, you have to continue soon. I'm sorry to hear that we were about to use uh, different cryptocurrency to send money around. So, uh, would you like to continue with this one more time? The next time should be much shorter. Next time should be much shorter, about 40 minutes, I think. We we are going to send a transaction. We are going to send a transaction and you will learn about the other cryptocurrency uh, that will build technologically that builds on Bitcoin. That's even more important than Bitcoin, in my opinion. OK, so um, I guess next week we can continue with this one. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a great time with you. I hope that you learned a lot. Are there any questions? Either are there any questions, guys? Everything OK? OK, so the next lesson, let's say next week, I guess next week, yeah, we are going to do it next week. We are going to start from here, from the wallets. You are going to create a wallet. Then we will talk about Ethereum and smart contracts. Then there will be the summary. We are going to see a short film about this. And then we will go back to terminology. And you tell me all about the terminology here. And then I will tell you how you can continue with your studies. This is all here. OK? So thank you very much, gentlemen. That's all for today. Uh, that's all for today. And uh, I will see you next time. OK, guys? So uh, I will share this again for the first years and the second years. And bye-bye. Take care. It was a pleasure. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.